Good afternoon to you and thank you for joining us on Hot Issues on TV3. I am Nuong Falong. On our seat today is a man who is both an energy expert and a politician. His name quite synonymous with the National Democratic Congresses. One time Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation and before that the CEO of the National Petroleum Authority. We have in the studio with us Alexander Kofi Mould, popularly called Alex Mould. Mr. Mould, yes. thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. How have you been feeling your days lately? Well, um, apart from doing the normal consulting work in the energy industry and in the finance industry, um, I've been working with the party to make sure that our party is fit for purpose. When you say you're working with the party to ensure it's fit for purpose, what kind of activity is going to that? Working with the branches, working with the constituencies, um, ensuring that the branches um, have the scope of work that they are supposed to do, um, working with the constituencies to make sure that we have the structures um, to help the branches do their work, and working with the regional executives to also ensure that the constituencies have their uh, structures in place and the reporting lines all in place to, to do their work. You're deeply rooted in the NDC. Absolutely. Um, let me take you back to August. Um, in August you released a statement um, and it read, I wish to state for the record that I have not been approached by the NDC flag bearer for the 2020 presidential election to play any such role by which you, you were referring to um, becoming running mate. <coughs> well, there was an article in the paper that suggested that, yes, I, I, I was looking for a running mate position mm. or that it had been offered to me. And I had to make it very clear that, no, um, that had not happened. So you were responding to an article yes, that, yes, that was, was in the news? Yeah, it was an article. That's, and, and by this statement, does that mean that if you were offered a position, you would say yes? Well, as you know, my role in the party is to do what the party wants me to do. So wherever they feel my strengths are, uh, when they offer it to me, I will consider it and most likely I will do it. Right. Um, there have been some questions about lobbying behind the scenes. Uh, is it something that's occurring? Well, I don't know where that is coming from because um, on our calendar, on our political calendar, we are working with the constituencies to get our MP aspirants. So that's where everybody is. Um, there, there is nowhere, there's no talk within the party about um, the vice presidential position. Um, our job is to do what we do best. Um, the various sectors that we work in, whether it's the finance sector or the energy sector, which I'm both in, I'm involved in both. Uh, my job is to do that. I think this may come up because they've seen me talking about topical issues mm. that have come up, especially mm. in the energy and the finance sector, mm. uh, whether it has to do with ACA or PDS or statements that the finance minister makes. I've been talking about them and um, to some people um, they think that's lobbying, but what that really is, is trying to get the ordinary Ghanaian to understand these complex issues that occur in the energy and in the finance sector and break it down for them to understand it because we need discerning people to understand what's going on in the country and what they want us to do. What about in private? Has there been any such conversation? No, absolutely not. There's been no conversations at any level with anybody, either from somebody or I asking somebody anything. Absolutely not. Do you consider yourself a strong candidate for the position? Um, I don't know what the, um, our presidential candidate will be looking for, mm. but I am sure he will have a criteria he's going to choose from mm -hmm. um, what that person can contribute to him. And um, I don't know what that criteria is going to be, but um, if it has to be to do with helping him win the election, helping him run the government, I'm sure he'll come up with a criteria and he'll pick somebody in the party because there are a lot of people who mm. are qualified for that mm. position. When, when you claim your, um, exactly where you're from, what, what region do you claim? Well. Uh, it's, it's a tough one because um, Greater Accra claimed me because I'm gone. My father is gone. He's from uh, Jamestown. Mm. Our family house is in Jamestown, Bruce mm. Street. Mm. 
Uh, on the other hand, my mother is a Shanti, so when I go to the, uh, the Shanti region, um, they don't know anything about your father, as you okay. know. So I'm claimed as an Ashanti when I go to the Ashanti region. So I, I have a peculiar challenge. But if I have even a further challenge in that my, my grandfather, my father's father is from Winneba. We, we belong to the Gati family. So it's kind of complex. Do you think this challenge could in any way disadvantage you? Because um, the NDC is noted for usually going towards the central region. You mean disadvantage me in positioning me in the party? I think they are going to look at my, um, what I offer to the party, what I can do for the party. Mm. They're not going to, I don't think they're going to look at whether I am this thing to make me a CEO of a company or a minister well, well, or, or wait, wait, a district, actually, a district uh, chief executive. I don't think they will look at that. Well, I'm actually referring to the running mate position. Do you oh. think being from the Ashanti region disadvantages you? Because the NDC usually goes for someone from the central region. I, I have no <laughs> clue what they will be looking for. Um, I don't think that um, uh, that will play the biggest part in who they will um, mm. nominate. Mm. They will nominate somebody who they believe can really work with the president to achieve the goals of the NDC. And that is going to be in the consultative discussion uh, with the elders of the party, with the executives of the party, and with the, our leader of the party. If you could advise uh, the flag bearer, who is John Romani Mahama, about the criteria to look at to choose a running mate, what would you say to him? Well, let's look at the governance point of view. And I, I always look at uh, any position that you are looking for somebody to assist you in. You have to look at yourself, first and foremost, as to what strengths you have and um, what tasks you have ahead. And look to see what complementary strengths you would need in your partner, be it a partner in, uh, in, in the, in the C-suite of an of a organization, or be a partner as a president, or even being a partner in marriage. Mm, mm. So let's go back to your letter in which you stated that you were working to ensure that the National Democratic Congress could secure victory yeah. in 2020. Does this mean you believe in the fortunes of the party come 2020? When you say fortunes, what, what, what do you, you, you think the NDC can win the elections in 2020? Well, I believe any organization, if you are going uh, in a competitive uh, environment, you have to be fit for purpose. You have to have the right strategy. You have to have the right people, organization, um, uh, the structure, and you have to have the right human resource, a human resource is, to actually do is it. Is the NDC fit for purpose? The NDC will be fit for purpose. It's like a football team. You organize the team, you bring in the players, you bring in the coach, you have the strategy, and then you start the training. And you, you build up, the, the team builds up to exactly when you are uh, going to competition mode. And I think we have some time, we know what the challenges are, we know things that we've been, we've done a lot of research as to why, why we lost the election. Uh, we've put a lot of things in place. Um, so we will be fit for purpose. We, uh, when we get there, I believe that we will have the right organization, we have the right people, we have the right logistics, and we should have the right funding to do it. Recently, the former president, Jerry Rawlings, um, made a few statements saying the fortunes of the party uh, were dim in 2020, and he advised some of them to look more towards 2024. What do I, you have to say I, to I that? I think the reporter that reported it misconstrued what the, our uh, founder said. He didn't deny it. No, no, he, he didn't say that. Uh, he doesn't have to deny it. You have to listen to what he said. What he said was there are individuals in the party who do not believe that they will win 2020. He, didn't, he did not say he did not believe. And what he said was that they were positioning themselves for 2024. So that was misconstrued again by bad reporting. I don't know which, but do you know I don't know which organization did that, but that was a boo-boo. And if I was in charge of that organization, that reporter would, would have to apologize to the president because that person said something off that should not have been said. But former President Rawlings did say categorically that there were some individuals within the party who were working more towards 2024. He said he did believe that, yes, yeah. that there were some Do you people. know any of these individuals? No, no, you have to talk to him because I, I, did not, I did not have the privilege of asking him who these individuals, is, who these individuals are. Last, last week um, on these seats was um, 
Brigadier Nunu Mensa. Oh, so and he's a good chap. Yes, yes. Um, and then he said uh, if he were President, um, former President Mahama, he would not run for the presidency. Well, we thank God he's not. <laughs> <laughs> you think there's any merit to what he said? No, it depends on um, where he was coming from. But mm. um, I think President Mahama has a good chance of winning. Um, President Mahama did a lot of good things for this country, for infrastructure work that he did, um, putting the economy on the right path, what he inherited. You have to look at, you know, when President Mahama came in, you know, what the, the situation was of the country. We had Doomsaw, um, we had challenges with our commodity prices going down. Um, 2016, which was the best year, one of the best years for the NDC after we had put in the, um, uh, the IMF structural adjustment program. A lot of things had been done to make sure that we could um, get the economy uh, back on track by 2017. And fortunately for, you know, NPP, they inherited all of that. They inherited all the things that had been put in place and all they had to do was follow the handing over notes and execute it. So when you say 2016 was one of the best years for the National Democratic Congress... I'm talking about uh, Mahama's uh, period. Yeah. Because Mahama took over in 2012 and uh, 2016. So if 2016 was such a good year for the NDC, yeah. why did they lose the elections? Because people do not look at the... Um, they look at lagging indicators, they look at things that happened in the past. Um, they don't, and I think we did not communicate very clearly what had been put in place, what had been done uh, to put Ghana back on the pedestal for growth. Um, so those are the kind of things, like I said, we, we realized that we didn't do well. So you did all the good work, but when it came to actually communicating it and letting people know exactly what you're doing, I don't think we did too, well, uh, too good a job there. We had Doomso, right? Um, doing so was a, a combination of having a financial and a technical problem. Um, and to solve it, you have to solve it in the short term and the long term. Uh, the short term was bring in a magistic, um, a plants, restore the electricity, um, pay the, um, the vendors that you owe and the suppliers that you owe, and then put in a long term program where you build capacity, you make sure that the uh, failing capacity which caused the doom saw is brought back in place and you also make sure that the balance sheets of all the, the players in the value chain are made better. To do that we put in ESLA and ESLA is a fund that's raised from petroleum prices and, uh, and some of the um, tariffs from the power sector to pay for the legacy debt. So guess what? M MPP come in, ESLA is in place, they raise the money and they pay the debt. Everybody says MPP has paid the debt. So you're saying the MPP is running on, on the work of the NDC? All governments run on work of previous governments, unless the previous governments have not put in proper structures in place. But this so one, the NDC essentially was just doing its job? We did our job and that's what you're supposed to do. And that is why if you're rating a, comp a, a government, you look at what was expected of them and what did they do. You're still watching Hot Issues on TV3. We have Alex Mould of the NDC in the studio. When we come back, we go into the second phase of the interview. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Hot Issues on TV3. My name is Nong Falong. Before the break, Alex Mould of the NDC was telling us about the structures the NDC put in place in 2016. We still have him in the studio and he's going to continue with his explanation. Um, so the good news was that they carried, uh, they carried on with um, uh, the ESLA raising the money to pay the legacy debt which we had ring friends. One of the things that we also asked them to do was put in place a revenue, uh, power sector revenue, water, uh, cash waterfall system so that each of the players in the power sector would be paid directly and immediately. That has not been put in place yet and we're waiting for them to do that. Let's go back to the fortunes of the NDC. The NDC lost by one million votes to Nana Ekufuadu. Uh, John Dramani Mahama is coming back yeah. to contest for 2020. His critics say a lot about how he's coming back with baggage. Do you think he can contest against President Ekufuadu? I think that he can contest against President Kufuado because you have to look at the data that supports the one million loss. What, what's it? And the data is very clear. The MPP actually did not gain much. It was the NDC that lost votes. Mm -hmm. 
So you have to understand why did the NDC lose votes? And why do you think they lost votes? Well, I think the NDC lost votes because there was some apathy at the grassroots level. Um, people did not come out to vote. So the real question is how do you get people to come out to vote? And the oh, way oh. you do that is you convince the people that um, you are, you've put in structures in place to ensure that their voice is heard at the highest level. Was there a disconnect between the grassroots and the party initially? That is what a lot of the findings are showing. You know, we've done a lot of uh, market do research think? on that. I, th I think it's true. I've, I, I work at the grassroots level. I work at the branch level. So the, the grassroots were essentially disenchanted with the party? They were disenchanted because they, I believe it was a communication issue. They, were not, they didn't have direct information as to what was going on, right or wrong in the party. And uh, that is, those are some of the things. And I think the MPP had a very good campaign as well, um, uh, blacklisting or not, not blacklisting, but um, not making sure, not making the NDC people know exactly what they were doing. Uh, they control a lot of the airwaves, as you know. The flag bearer of uh, the National Democratic Congress, John Romani Mahama, yeah. uh, very recently just uh, said, uh, President Ekufuadu wasted the time of the short commission, especially after the white paper that rejected uh, most of its findings. What's your opinion? Well, my opinion is if you are a leader and you have entrusted such a big job to very competent people, I think you need to have a conversation with them on their findings. And um, I think one of the things you do as a leader that has put in such a formidable team is you go with their recommendations, if even it's against what you believe. Uh, leadership is about taking those tough decisions. Let's go back to um, a few months ago. Okay. You delivered a presentation on ACA AGM. Yes, I did. In this presentation, um, and you have worked with the uh, Ghana National Petroleum Corporation for a long time, so you know your energy business. Is government failing to protect the interests of citizens? What do you think? With respect to this particular issue, yes. In what way? Well, at GMPC, we signed an agreement with ACA, with HES, who owned the block. And that agreement was very clear that GMPC would pay for 10% of the shares once ITLOS was over. ITLOS was, was the um, law of the sea uh, dispute with Ivory Coast. Mm. We started it in 2014 and we ended it in 2017. Um, if we had ended in 2016, I would have paid for that 10%. But it ended in 2017, uh, out, not under my watch. And we were supposed to pay for that 10% and we never paid for the 10%. And that 10% which is equivalent to two to three billion dollars um, now. We're going to pay about 40 million dollars for to again to earn something, you know, north of uh, two to three billion dollars. Mm. We didn't, we didn't, we did not pay for it. Right. So my question is, why did we not pay for it? Did you default only to pay more? That's your. No, I mean we didn't pay for the shares, so we don't earn the revenue. Mm. The revenue goes actually to the private sector. It goes to, it goes back to Hess, who has now sold its share to Acker. And that is what I think it's, it's wrong, and I believe a state capture. Because anybody who's truly a Ghanaian would not want 10% what is due the state to be given to a foreigner or somebody in the private sector. This is stealing assets from the state and giving it to the private sector. I believe that is wrong. Let's talk about state capture. You mentioned state capture. So, does state capture, is it nullifying the hard work put into building Ghana as an investment destination? Um, it scares some people away. Okay. Okay, it scares competition away. It will only attract investors who want to partake in state capture. And um, you will see that in areas where people have actually, companies have actually backed out of, of, of attenders or backed out of... You know what you're saying, cast doubt on the integrity of present investors because if you say it attracts only yes it does it, does. it, it, who actu want to participate in state it actually capture. does and the thing is that there are laws in their countries that stops these things you have the uh, foreign corruption practice act and in various countries you have various laws that do not allow them to do that and it is important for us to raise these issues with their embassies 
uh, with, their, with, with their governments that these things are being done because it takes two to tango. You could have people who can influence governments, people who have influence over government officials mm -hmm. to change the rules of engagement to actually benefit these private individuals. And the question is, why would you do that? And in, in, in serious countries, you have Foreign Corruption Practices Act. And this is something like, for example, the state prosecutor in Ghana should be looking at very seriously because this is, this is, this is not good for this country. Yes, how um, would you rate John Peter Mewu's performance? Well, before you rate somebody's performance, you have to put in perspective what was expected of him. Mm. Uh, what was expected of him, I think his biggest thing was he was going to roll out the um, tender bid of our blocks, which failed dismally. Um, we had over 40 people interested in the blocks. We had 16 people or so who took the actual tender forms. And only three people bid for two blocks when we had about, I think, about six blocks or so out there. Um, two, you know, 14, three, two blocks out of six. I don't know what, how you rate that performance, but in my, in my book, is underperforming in that particular respect. So you think the putting in, put in, in the energy, yeah, putting in the um, the waterfall, the cash waterfall, it has not been done. It was in our handing over notes in 2016. We had started the process, it wasn't done. Third thing is in our handing over notes as well, uh, the concessionaire of, of uh, ECG, it has been done, but you hear all the noise about it, the perceived corruption, lack of due diligence, lack of proper governance in the structure. And I, I don't blame him alone, I blame the advisors to the MCC, IFC, I blame, you know, ECG, I blame uh, MIDA, who was responsible to ensure that this thing went through, and I even blame the vice president for using his position instead of going through the correct position in approving things that he had no authority in approving. Mm. And I think we need to raise the bar as a country. Ghana needs to raise the bar in the things we do. We have to have good governance, we have to have the right procedures, and we have to challenge these procedures. We have to challenge the authorities that people are giving. Still on governance, Vaito Azim recently made some comments. He said the uh, NPP government is corrupt. What do you think? Um, if you have a concessionaire like PDS, mm. that originally there were five or six people who were bidding for it, and then you change the goalposts such that you eliminate five people, uh, five world-class organizations from participating, and you have only one organization participating, or two organizations participating, and you eliminate one of them, saying that they're already doing work with ECG, so they cannot participate, which is against the rules, by the way. It questions you know, um, the motive. It questions whether good governance practices have been Added. And that's why I'm not only blaming the government for this, I'm blaming, you know, MCC for not ensuring through its advisor uh, that, that the right things are done in this country. Because I expect the IFC, that's the International Finance Corporation, which is a World Bank organization, which has high governance levels, to do better and to ensure that they crack the whip so government, you know, uh, are, in, uh, are in line. So do you think there's some element of corruption in that well, area? Well, we're still waiting for the outcome. PDS was suspended, they were brought back, they were asked to work in conjunction with ECG, although ECG originally were doing this before, and uh, they sent out two different um, uh, organizations or two different uh, investigation teams to come up with their reports. Once again, the reports have been brought, like the Emil Short report was brought, uh, we haven't heard very much about it. Uh, the government spokesman says something about one report, another thing comes about another report. Ghanaians need clarity. We just need to understand what is going on. You have, you know, 51% owned by a consortium of three or four uh, Ghanaians uh, who basically don't qualify to actually do this work. Let's zero in. Yeah. You have cited several incidences you call bad governance. Yeah. Is Nane Kufuado 
corrupt. I don't know whether he himself is corrupt, but his government is showing a lot of things that tend towards corruption. Um, so you think the NPP government is corrupt? Well, I think the NPP government is not doing much to fight corruption. And I think leadership is all about taking the tough decisions and making sure people are in line with what you want them to do. So if we don't see a change, we don't see people being penalized for things that they are doing, that means that this is what is expected of them to do. And that is not good for us as a country. So do you, you now that you have established that the NPP government is corrupt, what about the leader of the NPP government? Is he incorruptible? Well, I can't see if he's incorruptible or not. I have not seen anything directly that ties him to corruption. But what I'm saying is that what you see from the government, from his leadership, is that they are not towing the line. And I think stronger decisions should be taken. And this is not the first case. We've had other cases. We had the boss, Movimpina. We had uh, Kelny, G, uh, GVG. We've had um, seat for uh, uh, sale at the, at, the, at the Flagstaff House or Jubilee House. We have so many of these things and Ghanaians just want leadership. We want the right leadership to ensure that we can reset. Things. Do we have the right leadership right now? I don't think that we have the right leadership because if we have the right leadership, action will be taken to ensure that these, all these corruption cases that come up um, are dealt with properly. <laughs> Let's assume that you get chosen as um, the running mate for the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress. How would you fare against Dr. Mahamal Dubamuya for the... Well, I, I don't know whether you... I can, because I don't even know what his scope of work has been and what he's doing, but as if... As, he's as, the vice president. Yeah, vice president has to have a scope of work. So if you are the vice president to the president, you are assisting the president in ensuring everything is done, you have certain sectors that you you are responsible for uh, to deliver. Um, you think Baumia does not have a scope of work? Well, we don't know. I mean, he's in charge of the economic management team. Um, mm -hmm. we, we know we know that the for EMT. sure. Um, and he's in charge of also the modernization, um, like information technology, and, and all of these areas. So, you know, is he doing a good job of it? Well, he's put uh, some structures in place. Um, as we see, we have the ports that have been um, modernized in terms of um, the paperwork. So some structures. Let's rate yeah. him on a scale of 1 to 10. Well, I have to know his full scope of work. I can't, I can't rate and him. And you don't know the full no, scope no, no, of I work? Don't, of I, don't know, I don't know what he has agreed to do. Um, I apart from being in charge of security, you know, he's also in charge of the police and things like that. Um, I don't know what actual sector he's responsible for. Is he responsible for the energy sector? Is he responsible for the finance sector? Is he responsible for trade? As a vice president, you have to be given some sectors to be responsible for. Thank you very much, Mr. Mould, for joining us. That will be all for today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And that's how we wrap up this week for Hot Issues on TV3. Thank you for staying with us. My name is Nong Falong. In the studio, we have had Alexander Mould, of the National Democratic Congress. He has put a simple question to Dr. Mahamadou Baumia. What is your scope of work? Join us again next week, same time. Good afternoon.